layers, so many open questions, which, is, which in no way are excluding our engagement on the other hand. You, know, you can have this open mind, you can have this not ready-made thing, and you can still have the strong feeling that something must be done, and that art cannot stay aside uh, in such a uh, situation. And so, but it is also not the thing Matisse should have stopped painting uh, because of that. But maybe a younger Matisse might have been also in his night hours another uh, person. So there is no excuse of art saying, I, because I'm an artist, I'm not uh, getting into trouble with the real life. But again, it's nothing you said as a conclusion here. You post as yeah, challenges, questions we face and questions we might, or challenges we might not always meet. Sometimes we will fail in it too. And that is part of our history and of our <coughs> too. So it was a real impressive and Thank you very much and I hope you have a good discussion. Thank you so much, Wolfgang. Well, that was lovely to hear from Wolfgang, as you can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> seat suddenly got cool, <laughs> and so I'm just happy as can be. Uh, now actually, you know, I thought maybe my introduction really goes with my earlier work more than this work. This work is much more fixed in this open, and as I said to Diane right before I got up here, mentioned this to her, she said, well, the time's called for it. And that's true. I wanted to make a piece that wasn't going to only appeal to you know, the avant-garde audience that would make the meaning. They could still work with the question. That wasn't going to be cemented in. But I did fix the voice and image so many times, which those of you who've been in my class saw me rupture <laughs> that kind of union um, throughout the last two days. So this might have come as a shock to you. Um, <laughs> right, right? <laughs> Uh, but now, is there anything we need to um, talk about, or say, or express, or questions? I'm open to anything. Yes? Yeah, um, thanks for that. That was good. That was really good. I just wanted to talk about the um, idea of balance. Um, you obviously understand that art runs a real risk when it, it desires to pose philosophical questions or political questions. and. Um, along with or through an agenda of experimentation in the medium. And uh, it's always a really fine balance, I think. And it could either work with each other or discredit each other. And uh, especially the images that you use are really strong. And you seem to have a really strong grip on that. And that's impressive. And I was just wondering if you had any thoughts or ideas around that or how it works out in your process um, through, your, through your working process. Everybody heard that? Yeah. You really abstraction and literalness and how to keep the balance of the two. Um, art and politics, really, I guess, because Matisse lives inside me as much as the political activist and wanting to be understood by you, the audience. Keeping the balance that way where I don't go too much one way or the other. Having a couple audiences at Harvard, luckily, I had a chance to do the editing at a residency there, so I had a, you know, bright audience to show the film to, and on the first projection, uh, or first cut of the film, all the artists felt attacked, all the novelists, the poets, um, the, and the argument split into the room that I dichotomized, the, uh, split the audience in half, and I didn't like that at all, it wasn't what I wanted to do, so then I was able to find the uh, grandchildren of Matisse, which made a stronger case for Matisse, and we could then identify and sympathize with him. And that brought the balance in. So um, as Wolfgang said, which is what I was hoping for, a point of view wouldn't be established, which is a no-no in traditional documentary filmmaking. We, we've seen Michael Moore's work. And the last work, you know, there's no escape point of view. We're locked in at every movement. And not that I'm against that point of view, but I'm against that way of being told to think. So that's, you know, was kind of the challenge. And so it just meant when I thought I was through with the film or had everything I needed, I needed to stop and go find another way to gather more materials in 
to make a, a more open film. You know, and then people will say in the audience, well, what was your point of view? Well, my point of view is Matisse. Yes, he was an old man, but he could have given money. <laughs> he just made that sale, 100,000 francs for that little painting, you know. If he had known about what was going on, it's clear he didn't. So, you know, as an aging artist myself, almost <coughs> Matisse's age, is my responsibility to try to get CN look at CNN a little bit before I come here tonight um, and think about, you know, giving some money to, you know, the Jerry campaign. Um, try to get out of my studio and get to Pennsylvania, a swing state, at least for a weekend to register voters in areas of the city where they might register Democrat. Um, these are the kinds of things we're called upon to do now, to step outside. And I just have to do it, but I swear I'm as much Matisse as he was, because it's hard for me to do that. So my, my internal struggles come out in the film, and that's why there's a balance, too. Thank you for that. About how your relationship to a given history might influence how you treat it in the film. You know, I'm not a historian, and it was my... Uh, my war to examine, I guess I could have looked at the Vietnam War, you know, and, and every investigation with the interview to hear things about how things slipped away from me. Every day there was a change. One doesn't know. And it's sort of like the attack on the World Trade Center. Shall I run up or down? You know, run up, you think you'll hit the roof, you think there'll be a helicopter there, but the door is locked. You know, you think you're going to Spain, and right now, Barcelona was giving them transit, was giving Benjamin transit. He gets there, that day they stop. The next day they open it again. Some people think it's because of his suicide, but the war was really like that. One day you can move, you know, into Basra, the next day you can't. It's dangerous. Um, so I found out those things. Um, but I didn't find out what, you know, how much of a resistor I would be during a similar situation, you know, or not even similar, but something even growing close. And I don't know if that answers your question, but it talks around it. <laughs> 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 but you know, we still don't really know about that arcade project thing. No. Joe Gerlin died in December. There's something in... Um, uh, was published in the Win internet that I printed out and have with me about an idea that somebody proposed about two years ago that Benjamin was killed by a Stalinist agent. And I just read it, the first page of it today, again. Um, and, you know, he thinks they didn't have enough morphine to kill him, and, Mor and, and Benjamin really, so he took it that morning, but he didn't die until 10 o'clock. That night, that's an awful long time, but I, as I read it again, I thought, I don't think that's right. I think he already split the pills. Obviously, the enough pills that Kessler had were enough to kill a person. So if he split them, maybe there's enough, but it might take a long time. And I have been involved with people who've been involved with assisted suicide during this time of AIDS, and nobody wants to live through the end processes of the disease. And it takes a long time to die. It isn't just because you drop pills, you're going to be gone in two hours or something. The yeah. body is resilient. So I th think I'd throw out that theory, but I'm still not convinced it's the arcade project because when I was interviewing Joe Gerlin, he felt kind of nervous. He kept looking at his, his wife in a certain way. I'm sure he's been asked this question again and again. Um, and now he's gone, you know, so we'll never know now.